let's get loony. All right, this is going to be fun. Um, let's just talk a little bit of, of Moon Logistics because coming up this weekend, um, there is there is an amazing, amazing eclipse. And so what I'd like us to do to get started is for everybody on a piece of paper in front of you without looking something up on YouTube, is to make a, imagine you were explaining a lunar eclipse to somebody else. Can you, on your piece of paper right now, make a diagram that would explain what is going on? Can you make a diagram? Let's just try that right now. Um, and if you're not sure, make one up. Like, do just kind of do like, I, this, is, this is what I think. This is what I think is going on. And um, let's just, we're just gonna take about a minute to do that. Cause it's, sometimes it's neat and useful to kind of see what is, what is in your head. And uh, what is going on with that? See if there's anything you can add to your diagram to make it better. So diagramming things that you think you know is often a really useful activity. So when things get down on paper where you're kind of like, huh, why, why, why is that? What's What's going on with that? In our, in our heads, things seem, they, they feel right. They feel right. So the idea in our head makes a lot of sense to us because we can't, the parts of it that are kind of fuzzy, they don't stand out. It's just like getting a psychic reading. You're going to remember the hits and you're going to forget the misses. So when you're just thinking about things in your head, you're aware of all the things that feel right about it. And all the parts that are just a little bit off, our brains aren't really noticing those. So um, that's why getting things out of your head, externalizing your thinking and getting it down to the paper. Now label that diagram. All right. So, um, I'm, uh, what I want to do is I want to for us just to kind of do a little bit of science geeking out. We're going to be talking about the moon. We're going to be talking about it in relationship to uh, the Earth, the Sun. We're going to be doing some diagrams of what's going on during the eclipse, and we're going to be framing out a um, framing out an activity that is um, that we'll be doing during the eclipse. And I want to encourage people in the Northern and the Southern hemisphere to be able to do this at the same time. And something that's neat about a, a lunar eclipse is that basically everybody who's on the night side of the planet you're going to get to see it and we'll see why in just a moment. Um, and solar eclipses aren't, eclipses aren't like that. Solar eclipses are like you special people who happen to be right here. So like everybody's like, I'm going to go travel for the solar eclipse. I want to get into the path of the totality. You will be in the path of the totality um, for the lunar eclipse if you just happen to be in nighttime. And uh, so we'll, we'll be checking that out and see why that is. Um, we're also going to take, a, I want to take a look at an activity that anybody who's an educator or a parent or just kind of a curious person, a little experiment that you can do that is amazing to help your brain grok um, eclipses and even phases of the moon and things like that. 
So I just want to share this activity that I think is one of the, um, the, the best little kind of lunar modeling activities that I've seen. We're also going to um, talk briefly about the influence of the moon on behavior. All right. Interesting. Hey, let's start with that. Because uh, raise your paw if you have heard that emergency rooms are more filled during full moons. Has anybody heard this? Yeah. So this is something that we commonly hear, right? You know, it's like, you know, it's a full moon, you know, people are out and acting crazy. Well, people actually, it's, that's an easy thing to check, right? You can look at admission rates and what kind of things are coming in during full moons, half moons, quarter moons, gibbous moons, and all other phases of the moon. Here's what we find. There's no correlation at all. None. The moon has no effect on our behavior. Um, emergency rooms are not more full during full moons, but you'll hear people often say that because we we kind of, we like this idea. Um, and it, it's an idea that actually has been popular for a long time, that the influence of the moon, it, it somehow makes us kind of crazy. And that's where the moon, the word lunatic, Luna, meaning moon, a lunatic or lunacy comes from, is that everybody thought that, that a full moon is going to make you nuts. Um, there's, that's, it's an interesting idea. It's just that there's no data that supports that at all. So now that we got that out of the way, it is safe to go crazy on the full moon. And um, the, uh, what... Um, I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to a to, to share a little screen with you, and what I would um, um, what I'm going to be doing is is just doing starting off with a few diagrams, and then we're going to be taking a look at some really fun things that we can look for when this eclipse is happening. All right. Um, I am now going to bounce to All right. Let's make a little diagram. And I've got some colored pencils here. You can do this with any color you want, um, but I'm going to be using a lot of colored pencils because it's fun. Um, and I'm going to pick yellow for the sun because Cartoon suns are always yellow. Um, here is my fluorescent yellow sun. Right. So light from this is coming out in all directions. Um, but people think of light kind of emanating from the center and kind of going out like this, right? So that all the, 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 the beams of light uh, we imagine those kind of coming out from here, but it's also interesting, you know, from this little point on the surface, if you kind of could see this little point on the surface, you'd be able to see that light from, actually, this doesn't show up very well on the, all right, um, I'm going to put uh, some orange around that just to make my, my sun a little bit more easy to see, but we have the, the, this this idea that that this the beams are going out straight from here, but imagine if you were here, if you're sitting over here, and you blocked this part of the sun with your hand. Um, so you blocked the part where light would be coming straight towards you, and you looked over towards this part of the sun. You'd still be able to see this part of the sun. That's because from this point here, right, light is coming this way. 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 So from all points around the outside surface of this sun, light is coming out in all directions from that surface. Whoa, wow, those are really hard to see. I think we have to go for um, pink light or magenta light. Process red. All right, so you know, from any point here, light is actually coming out from that surface in, in all directions. So not just 
from the point here. So knowing that, let's drop in a planet. Let's drop in, oh, I don't know. Here's our big blue marble. Now this is not to scale. Um, this is uh, the, the, the earth would be much smaller than this relative to the sun and further out. Um, but for the purposes of this diagram, this is going to be useful. So I'm drawing half of this dark and half of this light. Imagine light coming from here, hitting this side here. And this back side here is in shadow. So that's the shadow side. So this is the day side, this is the night side. The day side faces the sun, the night side points away from that. So then as that earth spins around, you go, if you're a little dot traveling on that, like, oh, I'm on the sunny side now, I'm not on the sunny side. So that's day, night happening right over there. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to trace a few beams of little photons, little adventures of the photon. And one little photon is gonna start down here on the bottom of the moon. And it is going to travel this way. It's going to go out into space. Whee! Right. So that little photon is going there. Another little photon out this way would be kind of traveling out into space. Another little photon is going to come up, whoops, here. All right, remember, they can go in all directions from this spot. Now, ones that come here smack into the Earth. Right? So, <clears throat> Right? So once the here smack into the earth, and that means that there is a little shadow that is projected out into space. Just from, if we just imagine that from that little point there, there is this shadow from light that emanated from here projected out into space. Now, of course, there's light emanating all over this orb. So light from here goes out in all directions. And that light, let's be one little photon here. It's gonna travel here. Out here, one that goes this way will continue out into space. Now, let's be another little photon that comes here and smacks into the Earth. Kapoom. Let's be another little photon that'll come right past it on the top here. So because ones coming here are hitting into the Earth, that means there is, from that spot alone right up there, there is another little shadow zone projected out into the atmosphere. And, and, ones that come right here from the middle, so now we're kazwap, right? If we come from this point here, we go kersplat into the earth, and ones from over here will go past it. Um, ones from here will go past it, right? Um, but but imagine this: the, the 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 source emanating the light. Think of it as by the time the light gets to the earth, the, these beams of light are moving very, very parallel to each other, but not perfectly parallel to each other. So the result is that in the shadow of the earth, there is where this shadow intersects this one, there is a core shadow that is the darkest and then there is a lighter shadow zone around that on either side. 
And there's, so there's a core shadow that is a triangle, a cone of darkness, right? <clears throat> the cone of shame, the cone of darkness um, uh, coming straight out of the, on the dark side of the earth. So if I were to take this, and now I'm going to, um, I'm going to do, I'm going to take a plane and I am going to put, imagine, visualize kind of a plane here into the shadow. And onto that, we are projecting a large cone of the outer lighter shadow. And in the center of that will be a circle. So a circle where this cone intersects it and a circle where this inner cone intersects it. You see how there's an inner part there. So if I took a look at this and turned it towards me, I would see in space an outer shadow that is progressively getting bigger. And at any one point, there's going to be an inner shadow that is progressively getting smaller. And these have names. This is the umbra. That inner shadow right there, that's the umbra. And out here, is the penumbra, the penumbra. So here's the lighter shadow zone out there and the inner shadow zone here. Now, <clears throat> the moon is spinning around. And normally what the moon is doing is in, it's around in an orbit that is at such an angle that it doesn't come into the umbra or the penumbra. So it's, but over time that's changing. And if we are, uh, if, <laughs> if all things align, the moon can go into this shadow on this side and that's our lunar eclipse. And so um, what we're going to be seeing if we imagine this view sitting on the dark side, looking out in space, that's this view here, you're going to be seeing the, 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 the moon, uh, imagine the beam is a moon, right? And the moon comes along and normally what it does is it misses, it, it misses that, that, that shadow. But today, and sometimes it goes into that penumbra a little bit and out. But, so I think I need a better moon. There's my moon. So normally the moon is just going to miss that shadow. Sometimes you see it kind of, it'll tick through a little bit of the penumbra, but the penumbra is very, is not very impressive. Um, the, the things that get our attention is when the moon comes into the penumbra and then starts to go into the umbra. And what we're going to get to do is to watch that event. And so we're going to see the shadow of the earth fall on that little moon. So the moon is going to be tracking in here between the, so it's gonna go sun, earth, moon, and the moon is gonna be right in that narrow little cone. And what's cool is I can see that from down here. I can see that from up here. Anywhere on this dark side, I'm going to be able to see what is happening to the moon. And this is going to be, this is, this is our big event. So here is, is what my, um, 
my, my challenge for folks is to do is to try to get a series of sketches and observations where we are going to keep track of the time and what do we see on the face of the moon? What do we see on the face of the moon? And how do the patterns change as they go across it? So my question is, um, so here's one big question. What is the size of the moon relative to the size of this shadow? Because what's going to happen is as our moon comes, so is it, are they the same size? Um, or is the moon larger? Well, if the moon was larger than what you would see in the full is you'd see the moon and you'd see the shadow of the earth right there as a little bullseye. But if the whole thing is in shadow in the totality, then the moon must be smaller than that shadow. But how much smaller? What we're going to see is as, as the, the, the critical parts are going to be as the little moon comes into this shadow, are you seeing a curve like this, which would be part of a curve of something that's about the same size? Are you seeing a curve like this? Are you seeing a curve like this. What is, so what we're going to do is you're going to, as accurately as you can, as we get, as the earth, as the moon hits that umbra, is to diagram what precisely is the curve that it makes. One useful way of thinking about this is you can think of the little moon like a clock. So here is noon six, nine, three. I'm gonna one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And I want to look on this, what time on this clock is this curve starting? What time is it ending? So let's say it ends at 6.30. And then how far out here across this does it go? Does, are you going like that between those? Are you bulging more than that? So the amount of bulge is going to be also really interesting because what we're going to do, if we can kind of get an, a curve, an accurate curve there, then you can get out a compass and you're gonna to try to figure out, can I inscribe a circle where it's going to go right along that line? How big is that? Is it like that? Is it that? And what I'm going to suggest you do is to try this several times. Try this several times. Where, where in, um, where as that little shadow is coming across it, um, where are you kind of getting the best impression of what that angle is? You're actually seeing the curve of the edge of the earth projected onto the moon. And then your brain is gonna to have to fill this in. And we're all gonna compare notes with each other. So that's our first challenge. We wanna figure out the size of the earth relative to this, but then, so it's gonna come in. So let's say it kind of, here's your moon. And 
it starts like this. Right? Then at some point, you are going to have another moon after the totality, and it starts to end as it goes out. Imagine it does this. So there's my eclipse part starting, the eclipse part ending. My next challenge is going to be then to take this, put one of these on one side of your circle. Let's say I, this is what I'm thinking is going on. And let's say it ends like this. Then how would I spin this around so that this curve could fit on my circle here? What I want to try to do is I want to try to figure out what is the path of the moon as it goes through this. Is it going right through the center? Is it kind of coming in one side and going along like that? What's going to be going on? So what you're going to want to try to do is to figure, see if we can figure out what is, what you think is going on with how the moon intersected the shadow of the earth. Did it slide through the top, slide through the bottom? The other thing we're going to be doing is um, actually I'm going to take a look at this call. I'm going to go to um, my gallery view and take a look at everybody here. Is there anybody here on this call who is in the Southern hemisphere? If so, do a little dance and make a loony face. So anybody on this call, turn your camera on and make, give me a loony face or just use a raise hand function. Anyone in the Southern hemisphere? Is there anybody close to the equator on this call? Hmm. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> um, what I'm going to have to do is uh, I'm going to send an email to Gail in Argentina and ask our little sketching friend there to be sure to record this because what we want to also do is notice from, here we are on our earth, here's our equator. And let's say this is gonna be north and this is going to be south. So you on the Northern hemisphere, you're looking out and what, um, what is the orientation of how that eclipse starts and begins? Right. What we also want to do is to compare that with somebody who's in the southern hemisphere looking out at that same phenomenon. How do they see it? Is it going to look the same? Now, the eclipse can be seen by anyone who's in the dark but how they see it might be different. And what I'd like you to do before we hear from um, folks in the Southern Hemisphere about what they actually saw, um, is I want to encourage you to, for yourself, um, predict how you would expect that to, to, to appear, right? What would you expect to see? Um, let me show you a few other kind of interesting resources. Our friends at NASA have kind of prepared a little animation. They've actually got a bunch of animations up and I'm gonna suggest that you don't go check those out because what, um, then what you'll, they've got an, an animation that is basically showing you what the path through the umbra and the penumbra is and how big the moon is relative to that. Let's see if I, you can actually figure those things out for yourself. All right, um, the, so let's see, 
I'm going to share a screen and check this little cool thing out. Um, so this is an animation that was made by, um, uh, th this is uh, from our, our little friends at NASA. What this little line is, this little swoop through here, is that is the line of um, where you can see the moon. So if you're in this little bell, you can see the moon, right? And um, that means it's nighttime for you. Um, this line over here is moon rise. This line over here is moon set. And as the night goes on, this moon rise to moon set zone, as the earth spins underneath it, is going to move. So this is the night zone. This is the night zone where you can see the moon. So this line on the left is moon rise, on the right is moon set. People out in out here, outside of that, currently can't see the moon. The moon is below their horizon. Here it's already set, here it hasn't come up yet. So as the night goes on, this zone moves from right to left. And at this point, it's going to start to, the moon comes into the penumbra, right? And so I'm gonna stop this. So at this point, what we're seeing is on this eclipse, if you are, if you're hanging out with Ray Bonto over here or Valters, right? Y'all are seeing the, uh, you are going to get to see the, the moon come into the, um, the, the, the penumbra. And same with people on the East Coast. So at this point, the penumbra begins. Whoop, not you. Ah. All right, we're going to fast forward to that. All right, the penumbra begins. All right, so the moon starts to go into the, 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 the shadow. And then, the moon will start to go into the umbra. So the, 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 the partial um, eclipse, when they're, 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 what they're talking about is that the moon is going to be going into the part of the shadow. Now notice if you're over here, um, let's say you're living up in this area, the eclipse is going to be starting. When this line passes over your head, the moon sets. So Volters is going to get the start of this event, but let's see at what point we're going to be at the deepest part. Ah, see right there. So now the moon is in, is in total eclipse. That means no direct light hitting the moon. From there to there, right? That means that if you are on this side of this yellow line, you're not going to see the totality of it. But you will see that moon start to arc across it. Now let's take a look at that over here. Um, I live in California right over here. So when the moon starts to um, come into the umbra, that's what's sort of the most noticeable part of the eclipse. When it comes into that umbra, I am going to miss it. By the time it gets to me, the, the moon will be close to, but not fully at, um, the, 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 the total. And then I will get to see that portion where it is all up there in the full shadow between this, between this line and this line, because I will be on the dark side. Nope, not you.
let's fast forward. Do 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 do. Right. So moon is getting darker. And oh, by the way, there's a little um, animation on the bottom there of what the moon is doing. Ignore that because it is not accurate for your latitude. So what is the angle that this is going to be at? It was going to be different for different latitudes, All right? And <clears throat> then um, Ray Bonto is going to lose the moon while it is um, while it's in in its full state and isn't going to get to see the light coming back onto the moon. But everybody else will. Who is well, people who are here in the United States and South America. Right. And then we go out of the 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 the, the partial, and then it goes out of the penumbra. You notice that the 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 penumbral eclipse is 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 not dramatic at all. So if you live where I live. The moon, when it rises, will already be in eclipse. If you live over here, then the moon will be will set before it comes out of eclipse. So by sharing information, we can get a lot of cool things. Um, the, the angle that you see the bite of the shadow come into the moon is going to change depending on your latitude, how north or south you are. So that's why we want to just ignore that little picture on the bottom. It's not telling us the answers, right? We want to see, we want to see how does this change um, for exactly where you are. And hopefully we can get in touch with Guile down here um, and be able to compare that real time with what we're seeing in other places. Um, as you are, hold on. So what you're going to be seeing of this eclipse is going to be different in different places on the earth. It's gonna be different north to south. And um, so at the, uh, the full moon rises, right around the sunset. Um, so the, um, and it sets uh, right around sunrise on the next day. Um, so basically nighttime is your window of opportunity for this. And if you are in this little zone here, you can see the whole thing from start to end. If you're over where I am, you are going to miss the start of it. If you're over here in this end, you're gonna miss the end of it, All right? Um, so those are, um, those are kind of some of the, the fun features for this, for this eclipse. Right, so we've got a, so we've got some folks who are right smack dab in the middle of this. You're going to get to see this whole thing, which will be incredibly cool. Um, yes, um, Australia is out. Uh, the Australians aren't going to. Um, I'm, 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 apologies to us, the Aussies. Um, uh, the, it needs to be daylight. Um, I mean, nighttime for you to be able to see the lunar eclipse, just like a solar eclipse is only observable by people on a small, one little part of the earth during the day. Um, and so um, big questions I have, again, one is from the Northern and Southern hemisphere at the same time, how do, are we seeing this from North and South? Um, also, I want us all to try to get a sense of what is the size of the moon relative to that umbra. So 
it's very hard to pick out the edge of the penumbra. When it comes into the penumbra, you'd be like, yeah, I think it kind of got a little bit darker, but you're not gonna be able to see like, oh, look at that, right? Um, so this is mostly looking at it that relative to the umbra, that inner core shadow. And um, the uh, one final thing that we, I want to encourage people to look for. And this is something that is visible to different degrees on different eclipses, right? Um, the, and somebody just asked about, you know, is the edge of the, uh, uh, of the, of, of the, the umbra or the penumbra really sharp and obvious. And that's, that's another thing I want people to really carefully look at because on some eclipses, the next phenomenon is visible. And on some eclipses, it's just, just it's, it's, it's hard to see. And we don't know, but this is an extremely extra cool thing. Um, imagine this is your moon. And uh, bonus points for anybody who wants to kind of uh, do the geeking out uh, on, on learning the seas, learning uh, craters um, while you're kind of waiting around. It's a great time just to re review like what's the sea of crises, the sea of tranquility, um, the sea of storms, see if you can get to the, see if you can see the seas, um, what craters you can find. They're all named after cool astronomers. Um, see if you can get your, you know, uh, your, your Copernicus and Tycho craters going. Um, so get yourself a moon map and play with that. But as that shadow starts to come across, right, and I don't know what angle it's going to be coming in. I'm just sort of, sort of for the purpose of this diagram doing this at this angle, right? I'm not saying it's going to be this angle. I'm saying that, all right, that's, that's sometimes when atmospheric conditions are right, right in here, you can see this ghosty blue zone. And as, so as it goes in and as it goes out, we want to take a look for it and see if we can see that. It may be, Sometimes with long exposure photography, it shows up better, but sometimes it's a naked eye visible phenomenon. And what you're looking at is really, really cool. Our atmosphere, here's the earth. Right? Our atmosphere, imagine a, I think it's, about 50 miles of kind of gas um, surrounding the earth in a layer all around. It gets more dense to, down below and towards the upper edges of it, it becomes thinner. But in that upper edge, there is in the so the, the, uh, what's called the stratosphere, the upper levels of the stratosphere, there is a layer in there of ozone gas. And that ozone layer, you've heard of it before. Yes, this is the one that is preventing you from getting bad sunburns. It does a great job of reflecting out um, all sorts of like super high energy light that will give you melanomas and all those sorts of things. And that's why we want to take care of our ozone layer. But um, as, um, imagine here is, I'm going to draw the earth enlarged. Um, light that is coming through, um, uh, through the, 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 the center here, right around the edge here, can get scattered around in the atmosphere here. And the, the higher, um, the, 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 
the, the, the, the, the waves of light that get through are some of the more low energy ones, the, 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 the red layers of light, you get sort of a sunset effect. The, the color that comes through, it kind of sneaks around here, is turned orange by the same things that sort of screen light out in, in a sunset. That as you're, uh, you, can, you can actually try this, take a glass of, of water and shine a flashlight through it, and slowly add a little bit more milk to it. And as you add more milk to it, it's gonna to start to filter out more layers and you'll actually see it go through. Eventually you kind of gonna see only red light coming through um, as you add a little bit more milk to it. So you're, you're filtering that out, but light that is coming along here, right? Along this edge, on the upper edge of the atmosphere, you have light that goes through the ozone layer and that is going to come in when it hits the moon. Um, you're gonna see that as um, a blue edge along and then the red core. So sometimes you can actually see the, the imprint of the ozone layer on the moon, which is just, I, I know Jack, I had the same reaction. It's cool. Who knew, right? Um, it is, it's wicked cool. Um, if the atmospheric conditions are correct, um, we may be able to see that. So that's just one more thing that we can geek out on. Um, we are going to have a Zoom room open for the entire eclipse. Um, so as you are, are, are out making observations, um, the, uh, yes, that, that, that's why, that's, that's why the moon is called the blood room moon, because you've got that scattered light coming through. It's turning red for the same reasons that the atmosphere as the sun sets turns red. The blue layers are scattered out and, and red ones get through. And, um, then all this red light is, you've got this, this scattered light. So it's, it's, it's really cool, but we're going to have a zoom room open and, I will put that probably today on our, our, our page. So anybody who anywhere in the world who wants to kind of just sort of check in, this is what I'm seeing. You're going to be able to do that. And it'll be fun to kind of see how much we can figure out. The size of that umbra, by the way, changes from eclipse to eclipse um, because Sometimes the moon is closer to the earth when it passes. Sometimes it's farther from the, um, uh, from, from the earth. So we're gonna figure that out for this eclipse. And um, if you did this over a series of eclipses, you can figure out that range and it'll be fun. So want to hear from you folks, any thoughts or ideas um, or strategies that you're gonna have for uh, tracking the moon? Oh, just, um, you know, for, for some folks, um, things to explore it might be interesting to do this on toned paper. Another thing that you might want to do is if you don't have toned paper before the eclipse, you could put a, um, a gray wash on a piece of paper um, or a purple wash. Why not? And then um, let that dry and then record your uh, moon observations on top of that. You could do that, or it also works um, great with tone paper, and that, may, that way you can use white pencils. It, it is really fun <laughs> to when you you know you get that little bit of that bright white part of the moon, and there's the dark part. You can get in there with your white pencil and go like, ah, ha, ha, ha. so tone paper is a lot of fun to 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 do this on. So thank you, uh, Ivea, for that suggestion. Um, and um, but you know any way you want to record this is great. I'm probably gonna do a larger picture of the moon and just to help me kind of review the, the seas and the craters. And then I wanna get some progressive ones. I'm really looking forward to, to trying to, um, <clears throat> trying to measure that arc and estimate the size of the shadow relative to the moon. And that should be interesting. Um, and it'll be neat to see how we get that in different places. If we can get people from the Southern hemisphere also, or just different latitudes, um, that's going to be, 
that will be really cool, really high percentage. So um, let's hear from you. Thoughts, comments, and ideas about um, moon watching. Um, or if anybody has um, something to share uh, from pages of their journal, we would love to check that out as well. Um, let's first go to Jack. Now, Jack, you're going to get to see this whole thing from start to finish if you're able to, uh, <laughs> right? So you are, you are in, you're in the sweet spot. I'm really praying for no clouds because I, I really want to see this because um, last time there was a lunar eclipse, it was clouds. Um, and do you know what time it starts? Like the starting of it. And I, I'm in Maryland, so. So um, the easiest thing to do would be to, I would just get on to get online and, and, and type in, when does the eclipse start in Maryland? And so for your individual location, you are going to, it's going to be different start times. Um, what uh, time does it start for you? Um, I haven't figured that out yet. Oh, my, mine will be right close to sunset. So right as the sun comes down, I'm going to run out and like, like, come on, bring up the moon, bring the moon, bring the moon, bring the moon. Because when my moon peaks up above the horizon, it's already going to be in partial eclipse. So we're going to have a rising full, um, partially eclipsed moon over here. But, but you're going to get the, to see the, 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 the nibbling, the full nibbling of the cookie. And I also had some journal pages to share. Um, the other day I saw this groundhog out with a baby groundhog and then it lost the baby groundhog because we saw the baby groundhog like make a break for the for the hole. And uh, I made a little comic of it like looking around for the little baby. Um, um, so this is my comic. Where's that sneaky little groundhog? Is that him? Oh. No. And oh. then a bigger one. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. And it, it, these, these really kind of have just kind of the hunchiness of groundhogs. And that on that one where its back is to me, because you put the, the kind of darker shadow in up higher and um, that lighter shadow in below, I kind of get the feeling of that little kind of bend of its spine as it's kind of put itself up in that vertical position. That's really cool. Look at the little groundhog face. Also, check this out just compositionally, right? We've got the major element, minor elements. That's yeah, really... Yeah, I was, I was definitely think, thinking about page composition when I was doing that. And then I took some pictures of a little house sparrow and did some paintings on him. Oh, oh fun. Nice metadata, too. How are you getting those perfect circles? I use a coin. I have this really cool... Um, this dragon coin, Ooh. I use that. I, I just, um, now for my metadata, I'm just gonna carry this little coin in my pocket and that's what I'll use for it. That's cool, I like that, I like that a lot. And um, yeah, and then I have, uh, this is my new journal and I just finished my other one. Um, then the last page here, I also did some page, page composition. Um, it was a little bunny burrow, my little, Cottontail. Oh, um, you, so you've got, wait, hold on. Everybody notice that on the word bunny, there is a little cottontail. <laughs> All right. Like, Bonus points. Right um, our gazebo and the hole is right under there. And then if you like zoomed in, that's the bottom of the wood. And then that's the little hole in the dirt. Oh, that's cool. And also and the, right the, 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 the kind of, uh, rough edge of the little gazebo picture is also cool. This is really fun. You know, some elements overlapping, some not. Um, so you're having fun um, adding some of those composition thoughts into your page mm -hmm. as well. Nice. I, can't I love wait for it. The moon. I know, All right? And that this is this Sunday, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is, it's time for us to get out and get loony. It is gonna be a good day. And we, again, we're gonna have a Zoom meeting um, open so all of us can kind of poke our heads in at any time. You can come and go where you want or you can just leave it on and um, no, uh, no, no pressure. I'm gonna be sometimes not there because I'm gonna be running out and I'll just be an empty chair here. And um, exactly, exactly. And this'll be good. 
this will be good. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, th that groundhog has got crazy game. That's good. And what's also interesting about that is that it's clear to me that you have been, you've looked at it enough to where it's really kind of compositionally kind of feeling so much more groundhog -y. just yeah. because you've had more time to look at the animal. You're really understanding how that little beastie is put together. And when he was running around, when he stood up on his hind legs for the big picture on my journal page, I took a picture of him. So that's one picture. But yeah, it was really fun to watch him. Like um, the baby was so tiny too. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And, and add, have some notes in there about sort of when you're seeing babies, these sorts of things that it'll be interesting to see if um, that timing of that, um, was this the, the first day that you saw babies out? Yeah, yeah, we've okay. seen we've seen this groundhog kind of running around and munching on dandelion before in our yard, but this is the first time we saw groundhog, a uh, baby groundhog. Um, and then yesterday we saw, so two days ago I did the one with the um when he was looking for the one baby. Then yesterday we saw um two babies with him. Um, right. And also I forgot to tell you Tuesday, it's really cool. I haven't done any journaling on it yet, but I ha I'm definitely going to. They're right next to our window in this like big bush, green bush. Um, there's a cardinal nest. Like, oh. like, like I just grab a stool, look over top of the kitchen sink in um through the window, and you can see like um she'll sometimes like fly off and go into the tree, and then she has like a little way of going through the um bush to get to the nest. She'll like go to the back of the bush, come through like a spiral staircase, um hopping on the branches and then hop into the nest and kind of get like snuggled in. That's neat. Yeah, so whenever she's uh, making the nest approach, she has to, um, that would be a really good thing to diagram and map, because what they're trying to do is to confuse predators. If they go straight to the nest, then the J is going to be sitting there kind of going like, that's where you put your nest? I can work with that? Buffet lunchtime, right? And um, so they will take these kind of, tricky sneaky paths and sometimes they have to 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 do different paths different approaches to it uh different times because those corvids will they, they will they will they will pick into any they're they're in sometimes you'll just see them sitting around on branches and what they're doing is they're just kind of looking around like what are my neighbors doing All right so if you've got that neighbor who sort of sits at their 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 on their porch with their binoculars <laughs> watching you know i'm neighborhood watch i'm kind of keeping eyes on everything well this 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 one is is doing it with the intent of of then going and eating everybody else's babies um there's this uh, amazing story that uh, happened out at point Reyes bird observatory where they were they were looking at white crown sparrow nests and you know how many babies they had and how and the blue stuff. jays would follow them yes yes that's right yeah you you told this before yeah, the, the Blue Jays were just watching the researchers and wherever the researchers would go, they would wait till the researcher left and then swoop down and have a snack. They must be smart to realize that the researchers are researching those birds and then yeah. steal their eggs. Yeah, the, as far as bird brains go, it seems that the taxonomic groups that have the biggest, best bird brains are corvids. So that's the group that includes nutcrackers, it includes crows, and also social parrots. Social parrots um, seem to, to have, have got, you know, people have the expression bird brain, meaning, you know, you're not that smart. <laughs> but what we've been able to um, figure out by studying um, African gray parrots is that the cognitive capacity of the African gray parrot is, it seems to be, you know, it's, it's, it's better than what we're seeing in dolphins and and, and elephants and all these other sorts of things and is, is, is on a par perhaps with some of the other primates. It, they, they really are figuring out all sorts of great, crazy things. A fun thing to look at is um, what's called the Alex studies, which were a series of research projects with this one African gray parrot named Alex. Um, and it will blow your mind what Alex was able to figure out. Wow. Yeah, that's and there's there's some books for adults and also some youth books about the Alex studies that are out there. I don't know the names of those. Maybe somebody if somebody finds those, please put them in the chat. But, cool. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. I will see you eclipse night, right? Let's hope for no clouds. Right yeah. now where I am, I have clouds. Yeah, right now it's pretty cloudy. So hoping that gets blown away. <laughs> That's right. All right. Um, let's join um, Kate, Ivea, and Ray Bonto. Um, Kate, good to see you. You can now unmute. Hello, everyone. Um, let's see, what have I been up to? I'm excited to see lunar eclipse. Um, most of what I've been doing lately, I started a new journal, uh, finally finished my April one, I'm on to May. Um, <laughs> fill up a new this one. This is like month. you're doing a journal a month. You're filling a journal yes. a yes. month. Except now I've upped the ante and now I'm doing two journals a month. So I have my sketchbook, which is like just rough sketches, anything goes. And then I have, what I'm trying to do is more of a nature journal thing. I need to break the habit of doing like, trying to do a nice picture um, and doing more metadata and stuff like that. Uh, so the idea is like this one, you know, I've got my packing list for my trip. I've got some like watercolor tests. I've got, you know, leopard shark studies, um, I mean, in San Diego and I know it's leopard shark season, so I'm practicing some stuff that I might see while kayaking there. Um, oh, fun, fun. These baby Garibaldi. Garibaldi. Oh, yeah. Let, 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 hold on, let's let's uh, re rewind, and I'm going to make my screen small um, so that we can see what's these pages a little bit better. Oh boy, those those uh, those foreshortened angles on the sharks there. That's yeah. that's challenging. That's really well handled. And the Garibaldi is also just really solid. I like that that curved I lateral line. I the fact that they are weird looking fish and that no matter how you draw Garibaldi, it's always going to look weird and you just have to, you just have to accept it. Wow. And wow. then the baby ones kind of look more like fish. I also decided that because this month, my kind of goal is to get good at foreshortening, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I went and watched a video on how to draw trees. I took some notes and then I've been doing, you know, my usual intense practice, uh, <laughs> especially because um, we're going to, well, I'll be spending some time in the South and they've got those beautiful oak trees with all the Spanish moss. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn how to draw trees that have the big branches that kind of sprawl out and go everywhere and ones that come yeah. towards you. Yeah. So I've just been doing tons of tree studies. Oh yeah um trying to go between like watching the instructional videos these were actually done while we were driving along towing the horse trailer to go pick up some hay uh and i was drawing <laughs> stuff i was seeing out the window mostly trees some raccoons um that was from bird pixel on my phone it was Ooh, a long drive night heron uh no it's actually the green heron oh okay yeah more trees nice, little landscapes nice, nice. um when we moved the hay, there was a nest of bunnies in there, so I had to go and move the baby bunnies. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's see here. I've got more of my arms being tired. Then it's goldfinch season up here in Washington. <laughs> um, and then these are multiple shadows on those. It's it's hard to put shadows in on yellow birds. Yeah. Uh, what have I been doing? Uh, that's just the shadow violet because you oh, know. That's what I do. Uh, yeah. 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 I know. I've been watching a lot of your videos. If you wonder where I get any of my techniques, um, yeah, most of them come <laughs> from you. So then I decided to, I went through my favorite set of historical paintings and one of them was a mockingbird in a, I think it was a Seville orange tree. And I decided to do, redo a modern version of it. So I did sort of a little study thing with some mockingbirds and then I did a little thumbnail. And here, I'll show you a little part of my process. So I have it this is cool. hung up. There's a few stages to this. so. Bear with me for a moment. I have, first I did a sketch on a big piece of sketchbook paper and then just took some markers and did all the color stuff. And I taped together some transfer paper and I did the whole sketch onto there. And then it gets better. It's still in the works. Um, <laughs> this is so cool. You I and also painting. just, you're having so much fun with this. Oh yeah, this, it's what I do. Um, so I've been working on this composition and this has been going since Monday, I think. Yes. Maybe Sunday. Yeah. I forget when. 
but um, yeah, it's not done yet. I'm guessing there's probably a few more days of lots of detail work and shading to go into that, but. I love all the variations yeah. of greens going on here too. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to not to overcomplicate it, but also with looking at how the leaves go back and the foreshortening and stuff. I want to try and figure out how to utilize that green to create the depth and create shape with the leaves. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of mm-hmm. my challenge for this. I really kind of went in at the deep end, but that's kind of what I do. So there's one more big painting I have before I go to the rest of my sketchbook, uh, if I can find it. Uh, where did I put that? Um, Hmm. How do I lose a giant painting in my own bedroom? I think it is over there on the table. table. I'm just making that up. Okay, I was wondering, I was like, where? There's no table in here. Uh, <laughs> but I figured it was a good guess. I figured it was a good guess. Yeah. Um, oh, maybe it's, uh, it's, maybe it's just uh, stacked behind that other thing. Yeah. Uh, huh. I'm gonna give it one more moment and then I'll come back to you guys. Oh, here it is. It's behind. I've got things kind of in a state of precariousness with packing. I have some green herons oh. and oak tree where I was trying to look at how yep. uh, Lurens and Audubon do paintings where I use some of the gum Arabic to try and create uh, a little bit of uh, luminosity and kind of that varnish in there that you see in some of the older watercolors. It didn't come out exactly as I wanted, but I feel like it did kind of capture the look of some of the like yeah. older uh, watercolors from the 18th century. Um, oh, and you may ask, how did everything go with the albatross? The albatross is still in my living room, keeping the cat company. I need to go to the art store and ask them what kind of paint to use on that. So you will see the albatross again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I have more. Um, oh, good, good, good. Yeah. So I went to the Burke Museum in Seattle with my sister, and they had all of these great specimens, the gorilla skull, sea turtle. They had a decomposing grizzly bear on a, um, a table in one of their labs that you could see. So it had like the head and the skull. And it was covered Whoa. in like, flesh and some hair. And yeah. I bet that, that room smells great. <laughs> oh, I'm sure it does. There's, there was a lot of decomposing animals in there. And then they had a great paleontology section. Oh, oh, what fun. Yeah. What fun. Nice three quarter view. And also let's hold that up again. The way you're using um, the value, the shadows to show the form and the depth on this is really cool. Yeah. I mean, schools make for such good practice for that because you really have to focus on where stuff goes. And I've got one more page of just bird doodles that I've been doing, some seals. This is a mm. prehistoric sea lion type thing that was at the museum. And then I just drew some seals under there and it's warbler season. So I'm kind of getting ready is that for- a, a, my... a Nashville that was down there? Yes, good eye. Uh, I've been kind of looking at like the uh, birds from the South and Southwest to kind of like prime myself for my trip. Yeah. My friend who I'm going with doesn't know that I'm an avid birder. So that's going to be a fun surprise for her. Uh, that's going to be a surprise. <laughs> But oh, you yeah. may get you may get them hooked on birds too. I'm hoping so. And I'll show you my little nature journal thing. Um, so I've been trying to just do one sort of finished painting thing every day. I think you guys saw this with the yep. um yeah. And then so this is a pond by our house, um, oh. Hogue's Pond, and I was trying to do a little oh. landscape thing. Uh here's some of the oh, local plants. That's fun. That and, and- Yes. And in that little pond study over there, um, just sort of what you're doing um, the, with, with sort of glazed layers, very, yeah. very effective. So you're not really doing a lot of wet and wet stuff, but more kind of putting down glazed layers, glazed layers that are then, um, so the edges are remaining crisp. Um, really, um, the, the, those areas that have both reflected sky and then you know bits of mud in them those places can be so complicated and this really it really feels like i'm looking out at reflect leaving the the water bright most people have a tendency just to put the water in blue but then they lose the contrast that that's really effective 
water has been a big thing lately, trying to learn how to draw like honest water um, and looking at and going, okay, what is the primary color of the water? And then how do you add in stuff in ways that tell both the texture and yeah. So just learning how to really utilize my watercolors well has been big. So then here's some of my house plants. I'm trying to do a lot more botanical stuff. I watched the Kentucky Derby with my mother. And while I'm not a big proponent of some of the practices with horse racing, I really enjoyed watching Rich Strike make that hell of a sprint. Um, wow. What a horse. <laughs> if you haven't watched it. It's pretty interesting. They've got more goldfinches. They're in the apple tree at the barn. Here's a T-Rex skull. Um, and then oh, oh. one more. Um, oh. I was out walking a friend's dog with my sister and there were some red-winged blackbirds and the cattails. So it's a little cartoony, but I was up way too uh, late drawing. So <laughs> Good for you. This is great. Yeah. Uh, and I also love the cattail that is starting to kind of decompose and kind of blow to the wind uh in those states they're so interesting looking yeah and i was trying to capture that instead of just doing like something that looked very uniform you know hot dog um yeah yeah so i've just been trying to like put down as much as i can right now my main thing is like trying to really put together good sketches and then um learn how to use my watercolors well. And I did have a question about that for you. Okay. So getting ready to travel, I've been refilling my watercolor palette. And I want to know how long you let things dry. So I'm trying to give it a few days to like really let the paint harden because this stuff went in last night and I've got two colors that are coming in today that I'm going to refill. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's, I think uh, with a few days, um, it should be good to go and close. Otherwise, you have to kind of leave it open, on, kind of on the back deck of the of the the, the car as you're driving around. But the um, <clears throat> I once made the mistake of trying to accelerate it by propping up a hair dryer next to it, and then I mm -hmm. left it alone and melted the plastic, and uh, uh, just sort of learned about uh, kind of the gener the, the level of heat that's generated by those things. Um, but with a few days, you should be good to go. Yeah, I noticed that like it's not going to move if I close it. Like I could close it right now. It could just have one day. But I noticed that the paint is still like a, has a little bit of give to it if I touch it. So um, I want it to be kind of hardened quite a bit so that I don't have to worry about just like turning it, it to coming goo. up too fast, turning it yeah. to goo. Yeah. So. We'll see. I'm trying to like find the balance between like loading up my palette and still being able to paint for the like day and a half while I'm still here. <laughs> so I've been using my old watercolor palette and I'm like, oh, I don't love this one quite as much, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's yeah. great. That's great. Um, you know, the drawings that you're doing there, um, that watercolor style reminded me of uh, paintings by Michael Warren. And I w just wanted to show some of these to you to see if, because it's kind of, there's some some verisimilitude with the style that you've you've got going. And there might be some things in this that make you kind of go like, ooh, I want to play with that. So I'm going to run over and grab a book to show you. While I'm doing that, show some folks, uh, just some, uh, the, just sort of do, do show, show uh some of the uh, you know other drawings or other things that are happening you know tell you what i've got my sketchbooks from uh the last couple months so if you want to see where it's sort of come along from and i found one from a couple years ago uh so yes. i'll find a few little choice things show show, really show us the show us the impact of those pencil miles yeah uh okay so um, i think this is from 2019 maybe Mm -hmm. Um, not finding dates on a lot of this stuff. Let's see. Mm. And it's not terrible, but you can also see just like what impact stuff has. Uh, let's see. This is a very nature journal esque type thing. Um. Oh, fun! It's a mushroom day. Yeah, compare. Yeah, take a look at the the bird that's there, and then you compare that with the birds that you're now doing. 
Yeah, no, well, that's what I was doing when I found it. Like, here's one. Uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll live stream drawing stuff for my history people and they won the Carolina parakeets and Deborah Sanson. So, mm-hmm. you know, you can still see like the remnants of some of this style stuff. And let's see. There's some fish. Ooh, are those? I'm not is entirely it... sure. It looks like we have a padded sculpin and a Pacific viper fish. Yeah, that top one looked like one of those crazy deep sea. Yeah. Oh, and here's the first class I went to that you taught that was on uh, drawing marine life. Oh, fun with the blobby. That's what got me hooked on this. The blobby there. The blobby, yes. I was actually (laughs) practicing some blobbies just recently. Um, Uh, I'm going to run over and grab this Michael Warren. Okay. Okay, Yeah, I will be here showing people birds. Yeah. Um, let's see. So then you guys have seen most of this stuff before, but like here's some birds from, um, let's see, this is my February book. So from February to May, there's kind of the, actually that's not a great example, but Yeah. That's fun. March. The, the secret is is the next one and then the next one and then the next one, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, every one I go through, like it's really rewarding to look through and see just the process. And I mean, I wish I had more. I made the mistake of, I used to send all my sketchbooks to my ex. Uh, so now, now I'm going to keep them, but this is like, yep. this is any, three any chance of, 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 of getting some of those old sketches back from the X? I don't know. We haven't spoken in a long time. I'm going to guess no. So um, if, if, if you want me to, I could write a letter on your behalf. No, 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 no. Than that. The, uh, no. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can't think of anything more intimate and and vulnerable than to give somebody your sketchbooks and but on the dissolution of that relationship it's time to give those sketchbooks back i'd say we'll see if she still has them oh uh, boy. yeah oh, yeah i know i that was a five-year relationship and every week i would send a letter with uh i paint stuff on the back like this is one isn't for her this is for another friend who's an avid birder but I paint uh-huh. things on the back of the letter. So there's probably several hundred of these that I don't know if they are still in existence, but it was yeah. quite an archive. Um, so, yeah. yeah I, I um, at, at, at one point in, in my, uh, it, I was in, in love with a, a woman we're in a long distance correspondence and I just, I would do like all these painted postcards and, and you know, sent all this 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 artwork through the mail, and um, I, I think that it has probably uh, since been recycled. Yeah, I know um, that's the benefit of dating me. You will have more bird drawings than you will ever know what to do with. It's a great pitch. I should put that on a Tinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so let me show you Michael Warren. Please do. Um, So um, this person does a lot of stuff with watercolor in glazed layers. So not just sort of letting everything kind of blend together, but you can see it's, you let it dry and you put the next level on, but there's also a bunch of um, of colored pencil drawings. Um, This is from a book called Shorelines. And let me, oh, oh, oh. Right. Oh, look at those. Whoops. There's that camera being glitch, glitchy again. Right? So, you know, here's this. I think it's getting a little bit stylized out there, but the, um, but Michael, a lot of Michael Warren stuff is very, very stylized, but it's all in this very dry brush um, and um, glazing 
glazing approach. Here's one of the colored pencil drawings that you guys, you can see it's, there is, he's sort of simplifying visual elements. Um, this. Oh my goodness. Right, so, you know, these are studio pieces, of course, right? Uh, yeah. But go wows. Um, lots of fun you know, getting this, all these kind of crisp edges by you put something down, you let it dry, you put the next level on, you let that dry. All these things drying on top of each other. Um, love this kind of interface of water um, with land right in there. Yeah. What an amazing the, composition. Don't you got to get this sense of space? Imagine this without those darks. Mm -hmm. it, go, That's another thing I've been trying to do. I've been trying to really punch in a dark point in all my current artwork because once again, it's from another video you did that was like five things you could do to be a better artist. And I took notes on that. And yeah. um, punching in that the darks yeah. really has brought out a new element to my work. Let's just use that same concept over here in these pencil sketches. Mm -hmm. Notice on these little puffins, how punching in the darks in some places, being intentional about where those darks pop in. These are kind of just sort of neat planes that are created with the pencil stroke directions, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to find a mix of sort of like doing the wet on wet and creating sort of a more fluid watercolor thing and just really figuring out how to oh my goodness wow okay what kind of birds are those these are these, these smews i have to ask vaulters and ray bonto i think those are smews let's, let's see there's a label on that <clears throat> I was talking to an artist at a Pike place the other day. He was a wildlife artist and he actually wrote a book, which he gave me a copy of. And he had this whole argument about, oh, wow, look at the pile of kelp. He made like a pile of kelp on the beach. So yeah. intricate and beautiful. Oh my goodness. Yeah, like these, these little, just kind of, it, it's what I, I, what I you, is neat. It looks kind of like, okay, there's a mass of kelp on the beach. You see, this is a mass of kelp because this is a mass of kelp. Yeah. And then your brain goes like, oh, those must be other masses of kelp. But then you start looking at, so what are you really doing to kind of get those textures in there? Yeah. Well, this um, is what kind of art I really love. It's subject driven art. I mean, it's a pile of kelp. It looks like a pile of kelp on the beach. And yet, while it's still true to what it is, I feel like it enhances certain details. So people who might look at it and just go, oh, it's just a pile of kelp. See, oh my God, look at the amazing colors and textures in this really mundane part of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the idea of sort of appreciating. Um, let's see, I want to find one point here is, whoa. Yeah. See, I really love the art that's like it's reverence of the subject, especially when it has to do with nature. Um, oh, wow. Look at the shells in the corner. Right. This is just amazing. Yeah. So this, yeah, this is one. What of, was this guy's name again? Was it Daniel the, the, Warren? This is Michael Warren. Michael Warren. Okay. And, uh, I think I should go look for one of his is, books. Here's more kind of wet, uh, not wet and wet technique, but this is kind of glazing layers for these. Yeah. Wow, look at that. And again, I love look it. At the it just looks so clean. That's yeah. the kind of style that, yeah, that's what I want to be able to do. I thought that this might float your boat. Oh, it does so much. And <laughs> yeah. he's just, that's just with watercolor, isn't it? This is this is a straight up watercolor here. Yeah. And then, then he'll have these other little colored pencil studies like this thing. But look at yeah. the, look at how so just using parallel lines to kind of fill in these areas, but you can kind of see these different kind of angles and surfaces, leaving some of these white, and then notice punching in some darks. Now looking at where 
Warren is pushing the darks. Mm -hmm. What what's the book called? The book's uh, called Shorelines. Shorelines. Okay. Oh yeah, I see it in the chat now. Shorelines, Birds at the Water's Edge. I think I need a copy of that. Wow. All right. So this is probably done from photographic reference. I would imagine so. Um, but there's no shame in that. And there's no shame in that. It's a useful. A suggest. lot of what I do is I stitch together photographs for different references. So it's not like I'm just drawing from a photograph, but I'll find, yeah. you know. And check this something. out. This is why I haunt used bookstores. Mm -hmm. 12 bucks, well spent. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've got a good one in town. So I'll drag my sister down there today and but, see if um, we can hunt. Uh, I'll keep an, an eye open for this in uh, used bookstores. The next one I find is is yours. I sometimes do find copies of this in used bookstores around. Um, yeah, but knowing that I'm that would be your jam. I it will... really is. That wow, those are just such magical drawings. Yeah, yeah. That that's. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What um, is that on the table? That me? is a Scarlet Runner bead. Oh. And for a little while, it was the moon. <laughs> yeah. um, hey, um, let's join Ray. Ba uh, actually, um, Avea, you are up next, and then Ray Bonto, and then um, Avea. Did you still want to share something? No. No, we, we'd love to hear from you if you feel uh, comfortable doing that. If not, no pressure. I'm going to add uh, Ray Bonto into the spotlight here. And um, I'm going to remove my spotlight. Hey, you guys. Good to see you. Hi. Um, well, I was very happy to hear that we would see a bit of the eclipse. Even though yes. it would be very late. Um, but here's the diagram. Oh, and with folks getting loony down there. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Oh, and how neat. That that's the, the first diagram that you did. This is cool. This is fun. Um, okay. What What's the skeleton that astronomers might find on the moon? What is the skeleton that they might find on the moon? What's the um, sign? Um, well, let's see. Could be what's left of the man on the moon, but then we'd have to do anaerobic decomposition up there. <laughs> um, that would be a challenge. Um, let's see. The, what skeleton do you find on the moon? Um, Tell me. It's a sign that the cow didn't make it. The sign that the cow didn't make it. Oh, very good. I love it. I love it. Ah. All right. Yep. So working on just sort of visualizing ideas and forms. Um, I, it'll be fun to see if we can kind of project that angle of that moon. Oh, and that's a neat um, little visual there that uh, there's a red thing, kind of a, 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 a um, next to those little cones. Are you, um, there's some really, that's a neat little diagram with the, the red on it. Oh, I just like doodling, that's all. <laughs> no, no, but, the, but these kind of doodles, you know, you're visualizing something in your head and then imagining like how if that twisted, what would, how would that re uh, kind of recede into space? Um, I uh, highly encourage doodling. Um, a wonderful um, thinker named Suni Brown um, has some uh, really amazing uh, resources on the importance of doodling. Um, and uh, that's, that's really fun. Oh, terrific. In my nature journal at the park today, I just saw this fuzzy ball plant. Oh, wow. Oh, I love the, oh, oh, check this out. 
I like the transparency. I also the you know being able to see through it, and then a few of those gel pen highlights. Um, I can kind of it just sort of feels like it's playing with the light and being able to see through the transparent part of it. Oh, that's really fun. That's really fun. Sometimes the fact that gouache can be a little transparent um, is an advantage. Yeah. Yeah, just how thick we make it. Um, and it's just by playing with it more that we get we get a feeling for um, for those 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 boundaries. Yeah, and finally some quick pigeons. Um. Oh, nice. Um, also, check out your line variation here. Um, some places you're hitting in a harder line, sometimes a softer line. The in, intentionally getting line variation, um, the more that that becomes part of what we do, um, the, the better. When Valters and I do the program on John Busby, uh, one of the things we're going to be pointing out is the way that he takes advantage of the same kind of line variation as you're doing. Um, and that just makes our drawings much more visually interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, wasn't it cool uh, to have that uh, live pigeon on today? Yeah, super. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was there were a whole bunch of of pigeons dancing around that apartment um that was that was that was pretty cool thank you absolutely uh really good to see you arpan it's good to see you too good to see you yeah um you. let's see what's up in um susan's journal the uh, are you looking forward to some uh, astronomical geeking out? If you have clear skies, I, I think I may have to go for the meteorological angle instead. Um, but we're due for some thunderstorms, so we'll see. But then again, so there's a really great um, there's this there's the Helderberg escarpment, which is nice, like sort of cliff that rises up over the Hudson Valley. Uh, sort of fantastic views toward the east, more or less, and and there's trees behind you, but they're not in the way. So I'm pretty sure that's when we have a really really clear shot of the eclipse all the way up as the moon rises. Oh. And if not, maybe I'll get some cool lightning across the Hudson Valley. Although I don't know that I want to be on a big old cliff during a lightning storm. So <clears throat> wearing a suit of armor. Now my <laughs> yeah. what could, we'll see, what we'll could possibly go wrong? Yeah, so um, so I was actually um, I have something to share, but but I was actually um, somebody just linked me to uh, something really cool from NASA. It's a it's a transcript of discussions of the Apollo twelve astronauts. Um, uh, I don't know if they actually landed on the moon or just did the thing around the moon. But one of the things, you know, so one of the things that, that occurred during during that, I think, sort of more or less, kind of before reentry was that they passed through the Earth's shadow. And so they got to see the sun eclipsed by the Earth. Oh, that's really fun. And so I was actually, so the thing is, this one only just like just recently links, links me to this whole screen, so I was trying to like, oh. give it through quickly to find, to find the bit. Um, I will put it in the, in the chat here. Um, but uh, there's a whole discussion, and I'm sort of skimming through very quickly, but there's a whole discussion between the astronauts and Mission Patrol about the fact they have still have some film in their cameras, <laughs> because of course they're using film cameras. And like, what should we do so we can get a really good picture of the sun's corona around the Earth? And there's all this discussion of sort of planning out how to do it, because they'll only have a very short time to do it. Um, and uh, then I, I actually just, just found the point where they're, actually, where they're actually getting to it. Oh, oh read it to uh, us. Read it to us. Yes, okay, so let's see. Um, so uh, this is at uh, 240 colon 33 colon 39. Um, Gordon, we're getting a spectacular view and eclipse. We're using the sun filter for the GNN optics, looking through and it's unbelievable. And White says, Roger, understand, Dick. 
Gordon says, the reason it looks so much different is the limb of the earth, and, then, and some of the transcript might be incorrect on that picture. The limb of the earth is eclipsing it. It's not quite a straight line, but it's certainly a large, large disc right now. It's quite a bit different than when you see the moon eclipse the sun. Um, Roger, the dean says, anyone down there know how I, what can we set the camera? Okay, there's some questions about the camera stuff. Uh, they better hustle, it says, because they're not going to uh, Bean says, funny thing is, you cannot see the earth at all when you just shield your hand from the sun and look out right next to the earth. It's not there at all. When you stick your smoked glass up, you can see where it's cutting the sun. Otherwise, it's completely invisible. Um, and uh, Oh, that's so cool. So a whole. So if you, if you if you find it's about halfway down the page, if you scroll down down to um, uh, two forty, I guess that must be two forty hours since the beginning. Um, right there, uh, and uh, and this might, I think this is actually. Yeah, sorry. As I say, I only just kind of I didn't get a chance to read through this whole thing here. Um, oh, no, but, but, I think but you can you can imagine like, those those yeah. those. Uh, I mean, and what what a, a fun thing on something like this to just change our frame of reference. So it how would that look from out in space? Huh? How would that look from the earth yeah. looking I mean, back at it? And the um, nice thing, you know, being on the moon at the right time to see the, the earth eclipse the sun would be difficult. But if you are in a spacecraft that is orbiting the earth, yeah. you may have more of an opportunity to see the earth eclipsing the sun if you just happen to be able to pass right through the earth's shadow. This is um, one of the photographs they took. Oh yeah, there you go. Yes, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's that's so cool. You imagine being one of the very, very few people in the universe, as far as we know, to have seen that sight. Right. Right. I mean, oh. I, I, I guess even if there are other people in the universe, they haven't seen that particular site because they haven't been to our planet, as far as we know. That's right. So them. yeah, yeah. The, 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 being being the only organisms ever to have viewed that um i i wonder what like like the um if if you are up on the international space station you're so much closer in your path that it'd be kind of like oh it's night right but they're they're far enough away to see them the earth as this little nugget out there going mm -hmm. over the Oh man, <laughs> like let's steer towards the shadow. Let's get into the Ember. Yeah, I, I actually, I, I guess from a certain perspective, every night we are seeing the Earth eclipsing the sun. It's just less exciting when you are on the Earth and you can't see the whole Earth. That's right. That's right. But yeah, so but as, as, you want to get the kind of a distant view from it. You can yeah. jump high, but it's just yeah. it's <laughs> yeah. it's not it's the not same. <laughs> But yeah, you know, someone pointed out to me that, that you know when you're seeing that ring around, you are seeing all the sunrises and all the sunsets of the earth at the same time. Oh. Everywhere on earth. That was the that was the part that was very just, yeah. Every place the sun is rising, that's what you're seeing, and everywhere the sun is setting. Hmm. 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 <laughs> Pretty cool. That's fun. Um, the uh, just wanted to uh, share since we're kind of on the the the, the subject here um, about how a picture can change your perspective. Um, I think it's also um, just useful to revisit this photograph. Right. Um, and oh, the earth is round. <laughs> well, you've got that going for you. But but also just how struck the astronauts were as they watched moon rise over the moon. Um, and here comes this in this colorless landscape, this little wad of blue poking up. Um, they were so struck by how special this was in the vastness around them. And it, it just sort of this, this feeling of ephemerality and that, you know, the living portion of this is just the tiniest little skin around the outside edge. 
Um, this image of the earth from space had a big impact on people's perspectives and the environmental movement, thinking about the earth as a, um, as this, this precious jewel that we have a responsibility and a duty to take care of. And I think it's useful to revisit this picture every once in a while, just to remind us of how, um, how, 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 how special that is, how important it is for us to be stewards of this incredible, incredible uh, planet. It makes me think of, of um, you know, we're, we're filling up these journals full of the amazing, amazing things that we're seeing, the tiny things that we see, the big things that we see, and every single one of us is seeing different, interesting, and fascinating things in nature. And all of those are all in that shot right there. So like, and sort of, I mean, it looks so tiny, but then, and you think about like, but how absolutely huge it is that all of us in this entire group have seen so many different cool things that are part of nature that are all fitting in there and are the tiniest fraction of what's fitting in there. Yeah. It's just, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any, uh, um, other folks who would want to kind of comment on on this 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 thread of this conversation, feel free to raise your hand, um, and uh, we can bring you in on the conversation. Susan, is there anything crazy going on in your journal these days that you wanted to? Well, I do have one one little thing. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, Tracy is waving. Um, oh yeah, let, let, let's bring Tracy in on this thread of the conversation, and then, um, and also um, Ann Chadwick, if you feel comfortable talking about what you just dropped into the chat, that'd be great. Um, so Tracy, you can now unmute, and I'm going to add you into the spotlight. It's great to see you. Hello. Um, I had a question about the eclipse. I've watched a few, and I'm going to have my kids. We got a telescope, and I had some questions about helping them view through the viewfinder because i personally struggle with that and i think it's actually kind of a holding still issue um so do you have any tips yeah. i mean the, the work, same thing binoculars microscopes i think those are challenging for some people to you know get the place in the right place like yes yes hold, um, it there. hold on um where is i'm gonna grab a little tube Imagine that this slinky <laughs> is is the objective of the um, of the telescope. W one of the problems is that when an adult sets up the telescope, they kind of get it at this viewing angle that works for them. And then imagine a smaller person who's not kind of what you have to be is looking down straight into this tube in order to. So if I'm at it at a slight angle and I'm looking down into that, I'm not really seeing the image of it. So it's like, it just looks black, it just looks black. I have to get my head up at this angle like this. So sometimes it's getting the, the telescope down lower so that little people can just, when they turn their head, then their head, think of the, you want to have this be a viewing angle that works for them because if it's at a more adult comfortable angle, they can sometimes like sit on a little, stand on the little stool and then they're doing this but then they're looking this way, not down this way. Okay. Um, so that would be one thing to, to, and then tell them that when you kind of get in there, just sort of be moving your head around and then you'll see like, oh, okay, that's where I want to be. But I think a lot of it is that grownups will set it at an angle that works for them. And then they say, oh, come look at this. But then the shorter person is looking at that from an angle like that. Okay. Has anyone done where they put the phone on there? I I have a telescope with that attachment and I, my phone was blinking out the last time I was trying it. It got like a heat issue and it was shutting down on me so I couldn't play with it more. Um, but I see people make beautiful videos and I'm and really capture a lot. And I thought that might be a nice way to allow everyone to see without having to 
have really good vision through, you know, my son's six and it's really, I feel like it's hard to, I mean, to get what you need to do to see it so that you can have that experience where you go, Oh, wow. My mind is blown. Right. Um, Right. And another Um, part of that is that, you know, like for me, I'm in the area of totality and it's going to be like almost five hours. What are some time segments to come? Like we're going to have a little um, fire and because it's the moon that one's not going to affect our night vision. So that'll be a little entertainment, but how often do you think we should come back to go, Oh, look how it changed. Well, one advantage is that it is a, um, because it's a long thing. Um, if you can have, and it's on the weekend, if you can have an outdoor slumber party, Mm. get the, uh, get sleeping bags, get little cushies and get everybody kind of out there together. S'mores are important for such an activity (laughs) and, um, and sort of make it this thing that we're out under the stars and the, the, the earth and the moon are doing this dance and then they will fall asleep at some point. And then at some point you can kind of get into the cuddle pile and say like, all right, let's take a look, everybody wake up. The moon has changed. And then all the people have to do to kind of, then you're there and you're kind of in your snuggly place and you kind of look up and the moon's changed. Like, Oh, the moon's coming back. The moon's coming back. Um, and uh, that might be a kind of a, a, a fun way to do it instead of like keeping everybody up or then like, all right, now get out of bed and let's walk yeah. across the house and like, I look up there because I don't want you to miss this. <laughs> like, that'll go over really well. <laughs> um, but I would suggest a backyard camp out. Okay. So if that, if that works with your, weather and humidity and all those other sorts of things yeah we're lucky i think it's going to be about um 55 that day that evening so that should work i'm sending you good weather thoughts thank you and we might have some we have some chance of thunderstorms earlier but i think by the time we hit this we might be okay excellent so and i'm going for um over the summer developing moon awareness so uh, we just got the telescope and my daughter's like, I want to see planets. And I'm like, it's the moon right now. So I think like moon awareness will set her up. Like new moon is star time. Yes. That's and, good. and so that she'll learn that and not be like, why am I preventing her from seeing planets? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a right. really cool conjunction building up right now with the planets that will heighten by like near the end of June, June 20th or so, I think. So it's a fun summer to do that. This is, this is going to be a really good summer. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, um, Let's bring in Ann Chadwick from Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, You were making a really interesting, uh, interesting thought in the chat. I'm going to just add you into the spotlight. Hi, everybody. Great to see you. Um, no, I was just so appreciating, Jack, what you were saying about that view of the planet. It really changed a lot of people's ideas about, you know, we think of these boundaries and borders and you're there and I'm here. And uh, you realize that we're all on this little blue marble out there that you can see from space. And um, when Point Blue Conservation Science was going through a name change, because originally we were Point Reyes Bird Observatory, and we were no longer based in Point Reyes, and we were no longer just a bird observatory, and had expanded so much, and you know, doing work all the way from, as I say, from the Sierra to the sea, and from Alaska to Antarctica and wanted to get that more global concept. So that's what Point Blue is about. It's that Point Blue out in the- I never realized that. That's really cool. Yeah. (laughs) And um, sometimes at our meetings, we'll hand out a little blue marble and, you know, just urge people to keep that marble blue. Don't let it turn red. (laughs) 
don't let it turn black, whatever it's going to do. Um, and so we're about and conservation. Leave the red one alone. <laughs> yeah, science. Try, try, and, try, try, and, try and fix things here instead of just going there. That's right. Like, like yeah. you know, we could go try to terraform Mars. That's the solution. <laughs> Then we're just going to have a, a worse know? a worse Earth and not a, not a good yeah. Deal. Let's you know, since we're thing. here, maybe then what if we put that same effort into trying to kind of make this a better situation? Let's 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 work on that together, shall we? Yeah, yeah. And realize that we're all connected, and that you know we got to take care of the whole community, being the whole community, that whole planet yeah. out there. So, That's right. That's right. Yeah. From space, um, you cannot see any boundaries. That's right. No borders. Mm -hmm. um, so from space, the Earth is the same way that the birds see it. Yeah. Right. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. And also sh shout out to Point Blue and the amazing stuff that you do. Although I do miss the old Oyster Catcher logo. I did like that. Yeah, I know. That's a tough one. We had uh, some people who weren't happy with the name change or the logo change, but we did move on and we're still doing the great work. So it's going to be okay. Yeah. That's the important thing as long as we do the work. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Um, so you you had something to, to a journal moment to share. I, 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 I guess I would say perhaps a little more mundane than the grand um you know whole planet but i think you know, i think i think the sort of a theme of, of there's very exciting things to be found in the mundane um so you may remember um a few weeks ago i showed you my my um this very cool sumac stem that i had yes found. yes and it was crested it was fascinated and um uh i've been fascinated by fascination uh, for a while, ever uh, since I went to a botanic garden in Phoenix, Arizona, that has among their many fantastic saguaro cacti, there is one that has this great hairdo, where at the very top it goes all crazy and it's fascinating. So I started learning about this, and so I've been kind of keeping an eye out for like instances of this, and I've only seen this a few times. And I think I had mentioned when I showed this to you um, a few weeks ago that uh, I have seen a couple of instances of dandelions being fascinating. But this time I found the mother load. And right now it doesn't say that, but it's going to say oh. <laughs> mother load. I found this little, this little patch of grass basically on the side of a road, actually the same place I saw that wild turkey that got killed by the road. Mm -hmm. um, and just the little scrappy little bit of land that you know isn't that interesting, covered in dandelions. And for some reason, there were a bunch that were all crested and all looking different. Um, oh, wow. So I Fascination, went, so, fascination. There you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not going to say crested dan. It will say crested dandelion. Um, the the, uh, the post hoc, um, uh, post dandelion. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, work is still to be done. I, I did realize I had gone so crazy just like doing all these different pictures of all different things I was seeing that I didn't quite actually take the time to do, uh, you know, sort of get the basics down. So I thought, let's just do a little sort of a diagram of what's actually going on here which is that a normal dandelion or normal any sort of plant, you know, it typically has a growing tip that, you know, a stem that is round, except in the case mm, of the mm -hmm. stem, which is stem, um, but the growing tip is for the point. And then what happens sometimes is for some reason that growing tip gets elongated into this like long stretched out thing. And everything that grows from that subsequently has this very sort of stretched out, like appearance, it's, 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 it's like you took, this and you just sort of pulled it horizontally and it's just as thick as it was but now it's much much wider and it's in the case of the it's in the case of that sumac that i saw it's starting off round down at the bottom and then it sort of started to to widen and change shape as it went up these dandelions are doing something different but i believe it's the same basic phenomenon but you see how you keep saying when you're trying to draw a flower right don't make all those lines parallel because they're not, they should all come, even if it's viewed from an angle, they're all gonna come out from the same point, right? Well, no, nope, you have a crested dandelion, that's what it's doing. So, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, it, so it's doing this weird, it looks really, really funky when you see them. 
you don't always notice them because they're all just in amongst other dandelions. But it was really interesting to see how many different ones and how many different sort of forms they were taking on. Um, so I was trying to sketch some of these. So, so some of them, it seems like some of them are going to seeds. This one I tried to draw going to seed. And from, from viewed from the side, it looks basically identical to the other flower heads that were near it that were going to seed, but you can sort of see that it's all flattened out. Um, this one was going to seed, but it actually was a very, very wide sort of ribbon like oh, stem. Oh, how a interesting. A whole bunch of flower heads. Yeah. But this one, it almost looks like it's trying to be three flower heads, but not, not quite. So that was really, and also I say thank you, Ivea, because I did your trick. I put, I did some of the, some of the, the petal, well, I say petals, but really it's the ray flowers. Um, like in detail, and then I just did some some scribbles. Yes, that's very <laughs> so, effective. Which is actually really, honestly, really because I do have a tendency to get really lost in the detail, and want to do like every single get every single petal in the right place, and then it just and then and then you you don't, and it looks like a mess, and you don't know what to focus on. So, trying to practice simplifying and just getting the important stuff down, and it ends up looking better. So I'm gonna work on that. So here's one that was only just a little crested, and then I decided to kind of try and get the um, the general sort of impression. Um, a bunch of these dandelions have these these like rosettes, where there are lots and lots and lots of perfectly normal flowers, and then just one or maybe a couple crested ones. Oh, that's interesting. So it's not something that's genetically affecting yeah. the entire. Yeah. So I was bunch. reading up on this. Apparently, it's typically is caused by like a. It can be like a bacterial infection, a fungal infection. Sometimes it's like damage or trauma to the plant that causes it. You know, sort of weird hormone imbalances causing it to grow in a funky way. There's lots of different causes. Nobody seems to quite know exactly what it is. Um, it is possible to induce that crusting in some cases. And you might, if you ever go to like, I know our like our like hardware store, Home Depot has the house plant section and they have a bunch of little cacti you can buy. And then oftentimes they'll have some of the cacti are actually crested. And that's because there's some species, I think, that they, the growers are actually able to induce that cresting or they'll take, they'll mm -hmm. take like cuttings and they'll graft from the, some of the cresting ones. So you can actually see that if you go to, if you go to the garden center, you might be able to see a crested cactus. Um, uh, but yeah, and so and so I was looking up this, and like, you know, it happens in all kinds of plants. And, and what's really interesting here, so, if uh, you could, some, some of these had really flattened out kind of rosettes and you can see there's a whole bunch of normal stems with different sizes, right? These are all leading out to normal flowers. And then one just very flattened stem. Oh, that is a useful crusting. little diagram. I like what you're yeah, doing. And then I had a whole bunch of leaves that I didn't draw the leaves in. Um, yeah, so folks, just thinking about visual display of information, this is a, this is a very useful strategy right here. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm again trying to simplify because I was really I was I was tempted to just like draw in the flowers and everything. And I'm like, no, that's not going to get the point across in the way. Yeah, and <laughs> I can also just sort of see the topologist in you, um, yeah. just going. Uh, uh -huh. So full um, on. Yeah, so uh, I'm actually going to go back over the, uh, there. Dandelion. Yeah, we actually going to go back this afternoon because I want to like look at the big picture more because I didn't have a whole lot of time in this instance, um, but. I, because I want to understand why are there so many crested dandelions on this particular hillside? I, I since yesterday I was like walking around my neighborhood looking for houses and yards that have lots of dandelions in them, and there's no. I think I found one crested one, um, and there's no other. And this one was like so many. So what I'm going to do a little quantification there. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and like you know track how many rosettes do I see? That is yeah. how many plants do I see? How many? You know, flower heads. How how many of those are actually crested, and you know, trying to kind of like do some speculation on on why there are so many. Because it does seem like it is definitely more than I've seen before, but it's also quite possible that it's confirmation bias and just haven't noticed before. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, so it's very cool. so I would encourage folks, if I if I may, to go and look at your dandelions and keep an eye out because you may well see one that's really funky looking. Sometimes you don't even notice unless you look really close down and look at the stem and you'll see that there's like a really weird wide stem. And then you'll notice that that's, that then if you follow it to the, the flower head, you'll see that the flower head's really weird looking. So that's that cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. They're, they're wow, like, that's and really, really fun. If you find the same phenomenon in any other kind of plant, I wanna hear about it because it's just, I don't know, it's just very cool. Weird plants. Yay. That's that's neat. Um, 
makes me want to go back and check out locations where I've seen fasciated poison oaks and see if I can get some data on them for you. Oh, yes, yes, okay. Don't, don't, no, no touch. No touch, no touch, no touch. <laughs> okay. Now no, I wouldn't do that. But now I'm wondering if poison ivy will do that because they're related and I'm not gonna touch that either, but we don't have poison ivy out here, so I'll keep an eye on. <laughs> and I, yeah, and, and do the leaves do anything different? Because like, the, actually, that's another thing I gotta add to this here is the, the, the flowers, the individual little ray, ray flowers, right, Adea? Mm -hmm. The ray flowers look perfectly normal, as far as I can tell. And the seeds seem to be coming in perfectly normally. I kind of want to collect some of the seeds from those in a few days and plant them. And see I see where happens. you're going. I, I see mean, where you're going with that. The question of like, because dandelions are non-native and they're invasive and maybe I shouldn't be encouraging them. But then again, I could plant them and I could eat them before they go to the seed. Fair. So maybe I'll do that. <laughs> so we'll see anyway yeah fun, fun, fun experience. oh that's really fun uh, susan thank you so much for that uh adventure that's really really fun um so there's good things happening um on this little point of blue light um floating around the universe um there is there is wonder and mystery beyond uh what we can possibly comprehend um Kate, let's bring you in as we're, we're kind of wrapping up here, but we'd love to hear any other thoughts from you. Yes. Oh, I just want to mention that while you're gone, um, I was hoping maybe, well, I was hoping for access to the calendar to maybe try and do some little clinics. Um, you've been such a great mentor and offered so much. I figured maybe I can give something back as far as like organizing some uh, classes on how to like intentionally practice or how to like stay engaged with practice. Like maybe we could do some stuff where you go through different like families of animals and then like find one little skill to master while learning and practicing this because that's what I tend to do. Um, I kind of just do something that's sort of like crossing pencil miles and chill like a little bit of guided practice. You know, um, I, I, I think that that is wonderful. Um, and uh, my, my, so yes, please. Um, but let's not just think of that as something while I'm away. Um, this I think would be something that the community could really, if you feel comfortable doing that, that the community would, 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 I think people would love to explore and 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 learn with you and and get more practice. Um, the uh, so um, why don't I make you a an author um, for the the calendar? And um, do you have your own Zoom account, or should we set you up with one? Uh, I would need one that could host people. Um, right. So what, what we'll do is I will talk to folks behind the scenes and see if we can get for you um, one of the Wild Wonder Zoom accounts. And then um, that is something that uh, you'd, you'd be able to use um, whenever you want to lead a class. Um, awesome. And that way you're not, you don't have like, oh, sorry, it's 45 minutes. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, because that's the great thing about pencil miles is that I love and this too, just seeing where it goes with everyone uh, afterwards. Right. Um, thank you so much for offering that to the community, Kate. Um, that would be, that would, I, 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 I think there'd be a, so much excitement about that. Yeah, I think that'd be a really fun opportunity to sort of learn how to teach and yeah. I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat, people going, yes, 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 yes. And a bunch of other hearts popped up. So this is oh, a awesome. good idea. Um, and we'll, we'll make this happen. Um, okay. So, so to, to start, um, just go to my website and set up an account. So just order a free item off the store. And when you order a free item off the store, you'll be uh, prompted to set up a cat, an account, set up an account, okay. give yourself a password. Then send me an email saying, I just made myself an account. I will find you. I will make you an author. Author, I'll make you an author. You can't refuse. <laughs> um, there we go. And then uh, we'll also look at getting you your um, own Zoom channel. Nice. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much for that.
And, and uh, folks, there's, um, if you also feel uh, inspired to get involved with this community and share things that inspire you, um, there are lots of ways to do this, lots of ways that we can kind of come together on this. Um, thank you all. Um, Kate, wonderful share today. Everybody, um, thank you so much for um, sharing those adventures. And perhaps I'll see you um, uh, th during the eclipse for a little more lunacy. Yeah, can't wait. Take care, everybody.